All right, everybody, welcome to the differential equations crash course. This crash course follows the Virginia Tech Math 2214 curriculum, but it will be just perfect for anyone who's taking a undergraduate to, uh, differential equations course. Uh, the objective of this course is to provide you with the basics and essentials for each chapter as we move through them. And I'm going to convert approximately 40 hours of the course material down into about an eight hour crash course. Okay, so with that being said, let's talk about some of the topics that we'll be going over during this uh, crash course. The first is going to be asking, of course, what are differential equations, right? So it's a little bit different than the regular equations and functions that we've gone over in the past. And then after that, we're going to talk about first order differential equations. I think we spend about a lecture and a half doing first order differential equations. Following that, we spend three lectures on second order differential equations because for those of you guys who are in engineering, the uh, second order differential equations are gonna be equations that we'll find throughout the rest of our engineering career. And then after that, we go into higher order differential equations, third, fourth order, and then we'll talk about systems of differential equations. So kind of going using some of the linear algebra stuff and talking about linear and nonlinear systems. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with our differential equations crash course. So in the first lecture, I would like to go over, of course, what is a differential equation. Uh, we'll go over some of the general forms, some of the notation, and then we'll go into uh, what differential equations is typically used for. All right, so let's get started. So the question is, what is a differential equation? Uh, in this class, we'll call a differential equation an ordinary differential, an ordinary differential equation, which is different from a partial differential equation. For those of you guys who are in, I think it's uh, mechanical, aerospace, and ESM, engineering, science, and mechanics, and then perhaps electrical, you might see partial differential equations at some point in your undergraduate career. Um, we will not touch on those in this class. This is simply for ordinary differential equations. Okay, so what is an ordinary differential equation? Okay, we call them ODE. So if I say the word ODE in this class, it just means a, just a regular differential equation that you know of. Okay, and it is defined as the following. It, it is saying that the derivative is equal to a function of ty. Okay, so upon initial inspection, you might think, well, all right, that's not that big of a deal because, you know, it's just a, a function, right? But we look carefully because the derivative is a function of the function itself, right? So I could go ahead and write, right, a derivative equals something with y in it, right? So the derivative and the function itself are related somehow, and that's not something that we've seen in the past before, okay? So for example, the hotter something is, the faster it cools down, okay? So if you have a super hot cup of coffee, right, the temperature actually drops pretty drastically in the beginning because all that heat, right, is coming out of the coffee cup faster, okay? And that can be modeled by, for example, T prime equals negative KT, right? This is the, actually the cooling equation. So the change in temperature is equal to the is proportional to the current temperature of the glass. Of course, this is a oversimplification of the cooling um, equation. And then of course, this K is simply just a constant, okay? Another one that you may have seen before is the compound interest equation, which says that the more money you have in your bank account or market, whatever, the more money you gain, right, from interest, okay? And that is going to be defined as P prime equals RP where P is the amount of money that you currently have in your bank account, and P prime is how much money you are going to make, or the differential right, amount of money. This R is just simply the interest rate, right? So if you have $100 in here, for example, right, and your interest rate is, let's say, 0.05%, right? Then the amount of money that you're going to get from that is $5. Now, if you had $1,000 in here, then you would get $50 and so on and so forth, right? So the rate of change is dependent on how much you currently have in the account, all right? Now, uh, for those of you who have taken AP Calculus, this, uh, you, you might be able to solve these types of equations, but of course, our differential equations get into a little bit more detail and complexity as we move forward, okay? So but before we solve anything, I'll keep going and talking about the general form of differential equations. So 
So in general, we have the following relationship. We have y prime of t plus p of t times y of t equals g of t. Okay, so this looks a little bit complicated, but all we need to know is that our y and our y prime are the functions, right? So those are the variables that we care about. And then p of t and g of t are going to be our um, sort of like our t functions, right? p of t and g of t are continuous, okay? And we can actually rewrite this into a little bit more nice looking thing as just y prime plus p of t y equals g of t. It's a little bit prettier to look at like this. Uh, you assume that y is just a function of, of t for now, okay? Uh, when you get into partial differential equations, then you might be a little, it might be a little bit more different with the way they represent y, but you don't need to worry about that for now. So what are p of t and g of t, okay? Before we talk about what p of t and g of t are, we need to talk about this. So it turns out that the way this is written, now this is not something that they're gonna teach you in the class, and I don't know why they don't teach it that way. This left side is properties of the system only, okay? So for example, if I have like, for example, my coffee cup, right? Then I can put all of my stuff on this side. So as you can imagine, it was the uh, T prime uh, equals negative KT equation, right? So I could actually rewrite that as T prime plus KT equals zero. It's sort of similar to this, right? So Y prime plus P of T Y, T prime plus KT equals zero. So this is the system itself, okay? And this G of T is called the input. Okay, so this is the system. This is the input to the system. Uh, sometimes we call it the forcing function. It doesn't always have to be a force. It's just something that actuates the system or perturbs the system, right? Whether it be like a temperature or an energy or something like that, okay? So this is the input. This is the system for every single differential equation. If you put a differential equation into standard form, by the way, this is called standard form, okay? Y prime, which has no coefficient, plus p of t y equals g of t. This is called the standard form, okay? Any, anything that's not attached to the y is considered to be part of your p of t, all right? So I think we'll go over a little bit, some examples about that in a minute, all right? But at the end of the day, if you guys take away nothing from this lecture, this is the system on the left-hand side, this is the input, okay? They don't teach it that way in the class, but I will show you how it becomes so obvious as we go through many different examples of first order differential equations and second order and third order and whatever, right? Because it helps you understand when you're, when you're doing engineering stuff, right? Designing things or looking at systems, okay? No matter what kind of engineer you are, okay? You need to understand that when you look at a differential equation, what can you change that affects the system and what are the input parameters that you can change, right? Am I gonna change the actual system itself in my design or am I gonna change the uh, environment that it operates in, or in other words, the input. Okay, so those are the kind of interesting things that you need to understand about differential equations. Anyways, so we have that. Okay, some examples of differential equations are the following. If we have t times y prime plus sine of t y equals e to the t, how do we put this into standard form? I think I pulled this problem right out of the textbook for uh, one of the homework problems, and Remember that our y prime cannot have a coefficient, right? Y prime has to be by itself. So anything that's in front of the y prime, you have to divide out. Okay, so when I do that, I get y prime plus sine of t divided by y times y equals e to the t over t. Okay, so I get something like this. And I ask myself, is this the standard form? Well, let's look because this is the system. Okay, good. And then this is the input, okay? Now, y prime is by itself. Anything that's not attached to the y or anything that is attached to the y that's not y itself is going to be my p of t. So this entire thing is gonna be my p of t, okay? And then of course, this entire thing is gonna be my g of t, okay? Anything, once you have y prime plus p of t y, anything else on the right-hand side is going to be my input g of t, all right? Anything on the right-hand side, all right. So 
these are my PFT and GFT. You're gonna have a homework assignment most likely in the beginning of the course that's going to ask you to identify the PFTs and GFTs and all that good stuff, okay? And you'll find how important it is to be able to identify those uh, when we move on to the next page. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about briefly is direction fields. And because, you know, suppose that we don't know how to, we, we don't know how to solve these yet, right? We, you know, we have no idea how to solve these quite yet. I think we talk about that either at the end of this lecture or during the next lecture. But suppose I want to visualize what my options of solutions are, okay? I wanna visualize what options I have for my solutions. So as you can see here, my y prime is equal to f of ty. So what I can do is I can actually create a coordinate axis with t on the x-axis and y on the y-axis, and then I could plot something. Okay, what am I gonna plot? Well, it's gonna be y prime, okay? How do I represent y prime? Well, it's going to be a value of slope, right? Because y prime is generally the slope of something. So I can plot the derivative at any given set of points. This method is going to be called a direction field, or this, this plot is called a direction field. And this just helps us visualize what the kind of flow of the differential equation is without actually solving anything. Okay, so let's go ahead and do an example, a very simple function, which is gonna be y prime plus t over y equals zero. The first thing we need to do is put it into this form. Okay, note that this is not standard form. We're just solving for y prime, and we get y prime equals negative t over y. Uh, on an exam or a homework, they're probably gonna ask you just to do like a one by one square, like just do the origin, do this point, like these points right here, which is just like negative one to one, right? So these nine points, um, maybe on a homework if you have more time, they'll ask you to do like a two by, like up to from negative two to two, 25 points, that's too much time, right? But I think you guys will get the picture by doing this, okay? So all we have to do is look at each coordinate and just plug in the points, okay? Just plug in the points. So we have, uh, 0, 0, we plug that into here, 0 divided by 0, uh, that's indeterminate, so we're just going to leave it as a dot, okay? And then we plug in, for example, 1 comma 0, right? And we plug in 1 comma 0, we get, so, so 1 comma 0 is, of course, right, negative 1 over 0, which is undefined, but we can actually represent it as a vertical line, or if you like, you can write it as a dotted vertical line or whatever, okay? And then we just plug in, keep plugging in more points. So one, one, right? So negative one over one. So that's gonna be like this, okay? And then let's try one, negative one. That's gonna be negative one over negative one, which is positive one. So it ends up being like that, okay? Now, of course, your slope thingies don't have to be perfectly accurate. This is simply just a sketch, okay? Uh, but it is, and we'll see in we'll see in a second what uh, how it's going to help us solve stuff, okay? And then uh, zero negative one that's going to give us a slope of zero, and then zero positive one is going to give us also a slope of zero. Negative one one will give us let's see negative one one will give us a positive one, right? Give us a positive one here. And then a negative, negative will give us a negative slope here, okay? So we can see, oh, and the negative one, zero, which will be a, the same thing. So it'll just be a vertical line like this, okay? So we can see here that we have some sort of stuff going on. Now, what we can do is we can say, okay, well, if we start here, where do we expect to go, right? So let's just close my eyes, pick a point, right? Let's close right here, okay. Close my eyes now. Where, where am I going to go? My solution is going to go here because my slope here is zero. And then what happens when, if I go here, the slope here turns to one. So it's going to be sort of like this, right? And then, oh, and then it turns to infinity here. And then it goes like this. And then it turns to <laughs> negative. So it goes like this, right? So do you guys see how you can kind of follow the, uh, the direction field in order to sort of approximate a solution to sort of see where you're going to flow to, 
All right, so that is the idea of our direction field. Okay, um, I think when you take the actual lecture, you'll see what, oh, uh, like how complicated these things can actually get because sometimes there are like some, some interesting things going on. Towards the end of the course, when we talk about our uh, systems, then we'll talk a little bit more about direction fields for systems, which is gonna be a little bit more interesting. So we can go over some of the special cases during that time. Okay, so the next thing is, the next topic is our linear versus nonlinear differential equations, okay? Now, the linear differential equations are simply the ones that we talked about where we had our y prime plus p of t y equals g of t. Okay, now the reason why it's linear is because y prime and y have nothing really going on with those, right? It's just like y prime by itself, and then it's y here, right? P of t is strictly a function of t. I think that's the reason why we leave the p of t here instead of just writing p. Okay, so p of t is strictly a function of t. That doesn't affect my linearity of y, as recall that our differential equation is y prime equals some stuff. Okay, so therefore, we are interested in keeping these sort of like undisturbed, okay? And therefore we don't care about what's going on with the P of T and G of T. They can be as complicated as you want, but, they're, but that's not going to make my function nonlinear. What makes my function nonlinear is once I start messing around with my Y's. So if I have like a Y squared here, boom, unlinear, okay? unlinear, <laughs> nonlinear. If I had a y to the one half, if I had a square root of y, or perhaps if I had like sine of y, or natural log of y, okay? Anything that makes you sweat a little bit is probably going to be nonlinear, okay? So therefore, we, uh, we can classify our linear versus nonlinear differential equations. We are going to have different solving methods for each of them. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to use the same solving method, um, but luckily, being able to identify if it's linear or nonlinear will help us narrow down the choices that we need to make when we decide what we use to actually solve the differential equation, okay? The last sort of subcategory of differential equation that I would like to talk about for now is going to be the autonomous differential equation. I think that's how you spell autonomous. Okay, but the autonomous differential equation does not have a value of t in there. Okay, so if you find a differential equation that has no t's in it whatsoever, then it is going to be an autonomous differential equation. Okay, for example, if you have a very simple differential equation, y prime equals 4y, this differential equation is autonomous. Okay, and as you can see, because there's no t value in there, the value of t does not matter. Okay, so okay, so Scott, well, why why is that different than this one? Well, this is like a special case of this. Okay, and let me explain. So suppose that so like I mentioned before, the uh, compound interest example is y prime equals four four y. So sort of like if I had some money in my bank account and I'm earning for some crazy reason four hundred percent interest. Okay, so that would be my my interest rate. Now, if I start putting, if I put money in there, okay, it doesn't matter when I put money in there, it's just gonna grow. It's just gonna start growing the second I place money in there, right? But you might not start placing money in there for one more year. So one year after me, you start placing money in there. Now, your money is gonna grow exactly the same way that my money grew, except you're just gonna be one year behind, right? But you being one year behind doesn't mean that your money is gonna grow any faster or slower than my money, right? So that's what autonom autonomous differential equation means. It doesn't matter when you start, okay? It, it just, when you start, this action is going to occur. It's autonomous. It doesn't matter, like, if it's six o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock at night, whatever, then some action is going to occur, okay? And it's gonna be the same every single time, no matter when you start. All right, so that's the autonomous differential equation. Okay, great, moving on. All right, so this is the fun part. This is uh, actually, we're on page two and we're already getting to some fun. Uh, this is actually one of my most favorite uh, parts of this course. It's talking about modeling common problems. So one thing about differential equations is that we use differential equations to model things that we can't model with regular, 
right? Equations, like I mentioned, is very special because it's y prime equals f of ty, right? So when we have to model things, then we have to turn to our differential equations in order to do so. And you'll be surprised by how many things in real life are modeled by differential equations and not just regular equations, okay? So this sort of section of the course, I'm gonna go over four uh, models that are used in this course that will help us understand how differential equations are used in real life, okay? My goal as a teacher, tutor, whatever I, you want to call me, um, is to help you guys understand the relationship between what you learn in school and what goes on in real life. Because as you guys probably already know, for those of you who have had internships or perhaps any sort of real world experience or know people who are in industry, they're always going to tell you, oh, it doesn't matter what you learn in school, you're never going to use it in real life. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things that you don't need from school, but I want to show you guys two things. Is first, obviously, how does your how does your physical like technical knowledge apply from your academics to your job? And also, how can we use our critical thinking skills that we've developed from these classes in order to help us succeed in the real world, whether it be an engineering job or a hobby or whatever. Okay, so the idea is that you want to interconnect everything in your life so that you can operate with peak efficiency. And that's just an engineering thing, isn't it? All right, so anyways, the first type of problem that I want to go over is what we call a tank problem, okay? Now, these, all of these four cases that I'm gonna go over are going to be things that you, that you use in this class, maybe not the last one, but the first three, certainly you will get questions on this, either on your homework or on your quizzes and tests. So uh, pay close attention here. Okay, if you understand the way the problems are drawn up, and, th th and that's the reason why I'm going over these, okay? The teacher will go over it, but they're gonna just gloss over it. The reason why I emphasize this so much is because I'm a proponent, right, for not memorizing things in math, okay? Um, Personally speaking, I have been a math tutor or engineering, math, I've been a math tutor for seven, eight years now. And there are very few things in math that I have genuinely memorized, right? I don't even know the unit circle, all right? I'll be, I'll be honest with you guys. I have not memorized the unit circle eight, seven, eight years as a math tutor. Why? Because it's something that you can easily look up, right? But in, in terms of like understanding the way systems actually work, Okay, so you'll see here that it's, a, it's all about logic and understanding how it works in order to help you remember what the equation should be, okay? Because memorizing a bunch of equations, you're gonna forget them in a year or two years. So the second that you step onto your new job, you're gonna forget all the equations. But what I want you to remember is how you got there and the logic that you used to get there because that's what the company is gonna hire you for to solve problems with, okay? So that's my spiel, all right? First problem, tank problem. Okay, so suppose that you have a tank, okay, with some stuff in it, all right? You're putting stuff into the, you know, the tank it has some stuff, you know, suppose it's like a bathtub, right? This could be a bathtub with a drain, okay? And let's suppose that you are taking a bubble bath, okay? So you start, you put in your, your bubble bath, or your bath bomb, or whatever it is these people use these days, take bath, right? So put a bath bomb in there and you have obviously have a bathroom sitting in there, okay? Now suppose that you are interested in now rinsing off, because I'm sure that you don't want to keep bath bomb stuff on your body. So you want to rinse off, but you want to do it in an engineering way where you open the drain and then you turn on the water, okay? So you open the drain, water is going out the drain, and then fresh water from your uh, shower head is coming in, okay? Now the question is, how long does it take for this water to become like clear enough so that you can just get out of the shower comfortably, okay? Now we can use differential equations in order to model that. And so why, so why do we need to use differential equation? Well, because the concentration of bath bomb or soap inside your water is based on how much water is in there right now and how much uh, soap is in there right now, right? So the rate at which your soap is leaving 
right? The rate at which your, your soap concentration is lowering is going to be proportional to how much soap is in there at the moment, right? Because the first time you open your drain, you're gonna have a lot of soapy water come out, right? But after maybe five minutes or 10 minutes, then the amount of soapy water coming out is going to be a lot less, okay? So how do we model that with differential equations? Okay, so what are some of the parameters that are important to us, all right? So whenever we look at a new system, we need to ask ourselves what parameters do we care about in order to solve this problem? Now, you're not always gonna guess the parameters correctly, that's just the way life is, right? You're not gonna know exactly which parameters to pick, but luckily, I know what they are, so I will show you. So coming in, we have hmm, the rate, of course, having a faster flow rate is going to accelerate the process, right? So we care about the rate at which things are coming in. Okay, so R in, we also care about the rate at which things are coming out, so we'll call it R out. And then we care about the concentration of soap going out and the concentration of soap coming in. Of course, if it's coming out of your shower head, there might not be any soap coming in. Okay, but of course, if you use this for a general case, for example, like a, a fishing pond and you've got stuff coming in, stuff going out, then you'll have to consider the concentration of stuff coming in. So C in and C out are things that we care about. Well, do you guys think the volume of this tub is going to affect things too? Yeah, probably, right? So there's gonna be some sort of volume function. Um, now, the volume is going to be a function of T because the volume might not necessarily stay the same, okay? If you're draining out water faster than water's coming in, then your volume of the tub's gonna drop. If, you're, if you've got a super hose filling up this tub and it's draining really slow because you clogged your drain, then your volume is going to rise, okay? So your volume is not necessarily constant. Now it could certainly be constant, but it's not necessarily that way, okay? So in general, the equation that we're gonna look for is say, okay, well, the rate at which water comes in or whatever is going to have units of let's say um, liters per second okay it's pretty much any sort of volume per time okay so actually i'm just going to write volume per time and then the concentration is just going to be um, mass per volume okay so the concentration is just usually usually it's going to give it to you like uh, grams per liter or ounces per gallon okay or some some sort of weird thing usually they use kind of weird weird units for this section so just just keep an eye out for that because sometimes they'll give it to you in gallons and ounces and and milliliters and liters and cubic centimeters cubic meters all this stuff right so just keep an eye out for the units during this section all right, so if I want the amount of soap, okay, if I wanna know the, the actual amount of, of soap, okay, then what I need to do is if I multiply these two together, I end up getting mass divided by time. Isn't this equal to our mass flow rate? Right? Mass divided by time, if I multiply these two together, the volumes cancel out, I just end up getting mass divided by time. So my mass flow rate overall, Q prime, is going to equal R in, C in minus R out, C out. Okay, now that is the differential equation that models this, okay? But now you're wondering, hey, Scott, where's the volume here and where is Q? It's a Q prime, has to, there has to be some sort of Q here, okay? So let's look at what these things actually mean, okay? R in, usually is going to be a parameter that's given to you and the concentration in will also be a parameter that's given to you right if you turn on the shower head right you know what the flow rate of that shower head is and you know the concentration coming out of the shower head in this case is zero okay r out is the rate at which water comes out of the tub okay and c out is the concentration of soap inside the tub at any given time. And we said concentration was going to be volume over time, right? Well, if concentration is volume over time, then isn't my concentration just going to be, uh, or sorry, my concentration is mass over volume, excuse me, right? My, my concentration is mass over volume, then the mass of my 
uh, soap at that time is just going to be Q, right? Because that's a quantity, right? So this is the quantity of mass divided by time. If I just want mass, then it's going to be Q itself. So my Q prime is gonna equal R in, C in minus, R out, and then my C out is going to be mass divided by volume. That's going to be my Q divided by V of T. Okay, Q divided by V of T. So, okay, now the R out is, is usually going to be known. They're gonna tell you that what the rate enters and, and what it comes out at. Very, very usually. Uh, if they just tell you it's the same, then it's gonna be obviously R in and R out are gonna be the same. And then of course, um, our volume function is simply just saying, hey, is the water level rising? Is it falling, right? If it's constant, you just put a number down here, okay? Let's rearrange this function into our standard form, which is just Q prime plus something times Q equals something, right? So we're gonna have Q prime plus R out divided by V of T times Q equals R in C in. Okay, let's look. Left side, what did I say it was? System. Right side, input. Look, Q prime plus R out and V of T are properties of the system, right? This is saying, hey, how, how wide is the drain hole? V is saying, how much volume is there in my system, okay? The right side is what? Input. I'm turning on my shower head and stuff is going into my system. That is the input. Okay, so that's an example of how the left side is the system, the right side is the input. All right? And of course, we can um, pick out what our P of T and G of T are. My P of T is going to be that, and my G of T is going to be that. Okay? So pretty straightforward. All right, so that's it for this. Of course, uh, I think in the next lecture, we will be learning how to solve this given some numbers, okay? So uh, that'll be a little bit interesting. All right, so on to the next one. All right, so this is going to be a population dynamics problem. And population dynamics is pretty interesting. It's, it's one of those things that people study all the time that is a lot more complicated than it looks, but of course we're going to simplify it down to a single equation. It's not really the way it works, but it, it is, sort of. Right? You, you can model that using differential equation. So uh, at the end of the day, we say, okay, well the change in the population is just going to be the birth rate, right, minus the death rate, right? And then, of course, people are allowed to move around, right? So plus my migration. Okay? So birth rate minus death rate plus migration, all right? And we said, well, the birth rate, our birth rate is dependent on how many people there are in the population, right? Because... Uh, if I have a million people, then I'm, I might be having 100 babies per day. But if I have a billion people, then I might be having you know, 10,000 babies per day. Okay, So the change in population has something to do with what the population is at that current time. Okay, So what we can use to represent the actual rate, right? like our, uh, our, our constant is going to be, I think we call it in my notes, Rb times P where P is the current population and RB is just a rate, right? So for example, in RB, did I use RB? I did. Equals 0 0.001, it means every single day, one out of every thousand people have a, a child, right? Just for example, okay? Or if it were in, of course, you could use time, you can use day, years, whatever you want. It doesn't specify here. So it, you're, obviously these constants will change according to what your time scale is. Okay, and as you can imagine, your death rate also depends on how many people there are in the society. So RD times P, these RD of course just means like, you know, if there's uh, a thousand people, then one person out of every thousand people are gonna die every day or every year, whatever your time specification is, okay? So if I plug those into here, I find P prime equals RB times P minus R 
D times P plus my migration, which I think for my migration, I just write M of T, which is just like, hey, um, there's people just moving into the city, moving out of the city, okay? Now, the number in general, in general, the number of people who move in and out of a city has really nothing to do with how big the city is. It just, you know, it could be like, oh, the school system, it could be taxes, it could be a bunch of other things. Obviously, this is not a uh, economics uh, course, right? This is just a differential equations course. So we're just gonna assume that it's just M of T. People just move in and out based on some function that is determined by economics or policy or whatever, okay? So if we uh, go ahead and rearrange this thing a little bit, we find that we get P prime equals RB minus RD times P plus M of T. If we move, scoot this to the other side, we get P prime, how did I write it? I put minus, so minus RB minus RD times P equals M of T, okay? Equals M of T. Now, again, let's look. Left side, system, all right? I'm not even gonna write this time. Input. Okay, left side system, right side input. Does that make sense, right? Left side says, hey, this is what's going on in my system itself. In my population, I have a particular birth rate and a particular death rate. That's gonna be this, right? Now, on the right side, I have an input, okay? The right side is going to be, hey, there's migrating people coming in and out of my city that has nothing to do with the current population, okay? Now, is my migration able to be zero, right? So the net number of people are gonna be zero. I think there was that one Simpsons episode or, I can't remember, it was either like Simpsons or like some, some cartoon, Parrot the Platypus or something. They put a dome over the city, right? So, so nobody can leave, go in and out, so my migration is zero, but my system is still able to do stuff. I'm still able to solve this thing with a zero as my input, right? So we are allowed to have zero as an input, okay? If nothing happens, then if, if nothing perturbs the system, then the system is still able to operate. Okay, we'll find right now that we have not talked about a key component to our differential equations yet. We have just talked about the differential equations themselves and not some of the other parameters that go along with it. I think on the next page, we will talk about, um, yeah, we, we will talk about the um, rest of the conditions that go along with our differential equations. Okay, so this is the population logistical, uh, population model, which of course can be simplified down to this right here. Excellent, on to the next one. The next one, which I know for sure that you're going to have, is going to be a radioactive decay problem, which is oops, something that I think everyone has, you guys covered this probably in your intro to chemistry class at some point, I think. Um, but it is a special case of the population model, it turns out, that where the birth rate is equal to zero, and the migration rate is equal to zero, which then turns around and gives us a very simple, right? Q prime equals negative KQ. And as you guys have already seen before, this is also exactly the same thing as the cooling equation, right? Newton's cooling equation. So this right here is a very popular differential equation. You will find when, when we get to solving this very simple thing, uh, you'll find, you'll see where it pops up, like where it pops up and why it pops up so frequently, okay? And you realize that you, you've seen this equation many, many times already, okay? So when I rearrange it, I get the following. Of course, Q prime plus KQ equals zero. It's simple enough, right? This K is our um, decay coefficient, right? So that will usually be given to you. And yeah, that's pretty much it for this. <laughs> All right, nothing too crazy about that. Um, the last one is going to be one that you may or may not see in this class. It's called the logistic model. Actually, I'm just gonna write it here. All right, so the logistic population model. Um, if you, I'm just gonna write it out and then we'll talk about what it means after that. So P prime equals R times one minus P over PE times P. So this, as you can notice, P appears twice in here. Okay, P appears twice. So therefore, it's you, if you work this out, if you multiply everything out, you get P times P, all right? Where R is a constant, that's just a rate. Our PE is, I think that's our maximum carrying capacity. Yeah, so the carrying capacity of our population. So this is just like, 
max capacity. And then, of course, we'll end up getting p squared, which makes our equation nonlinear, which is why I don't think you might solve this equation in one special section of the course when you talk about it. And um, if you guys want, just send me an email or a text or whatever, uh, and we can actually, uh, I'll actually work this out if you guys would like. I, I don't, so we don't see it all the time. That's the reason why I don't cover it too much. But I just want to talk about it briefly that the logistic population model, uh, we've all seen the logistic population model before in action. Okay, so uh, for example, during the, well, during the COVID pandemic, right? In the beginning, as you guys know, probably, that if, if only one person had the virus, then obviously it didn't spread that much, right? But as you spread to more people, Okay, as you spread to more people, the virus spreads faster and faster, right? Because there's more people are carrying it, then more people are, are giving it, and so on and so forth. The combination effect, right? But then what happens towards the end is that it, it tapers off, of course, that we had like social distancing and lockdown and a vaccine and all that stuff. But so obviously this differential equation model is not nearly comprehensive enough to take into account all those things. But suppose that we lived in a zombie apocalypse and we uh, didn't have any of those things, we just let the, the virus run rampant, then it would actually come across as something like this, right? Your, so your, your logistical model would look something like this, okay? Where in the beginning, not a whole lot of stuff happens, and, and then there's some, sh there's some crap in the middle here where it's like, where it's like kind of like shit hit the fan, right? And everyone's just getting sick, and then towards the end, right? It's like, okay, well, it's, it's gonna taper down and slowly become uh, flat up to the top where, where at some point everybody will have had the virus at some point, right? So in general society, right? Now, where have we seen something like this before? Uh, if you guys have ever played like Sharks and Minnows in elementary school, where in the beginning, right, you had um, the shark and then the shark was chasing around people. Of course, it would get a few people in the beginning, right? So it's in, in the beginning, it's, it's kind of hard because the shark is, is just going everywhere, right? There's only one shark and there's like, uh, you know, 30 other kids in the gymnasium, right? So it's kind of hard for the shark to get some traction at first, but after the shark gets a few people, right? Then those people, I don't know what kind of version you guys play, but they either become like barnacles or something, right? And they and they sit on the, on the floor and they, and they go like this, right? So then um, more people start to get caught. And then after that, you're left with like some of the like super fast people who can, can never seem to get caught right? Like the gym heroes who, who, who uh, go super hard at gym. Those are the people who kind of like it slows down right towards the top. And then obviously at some point the game has to end and then everyone gets caught, right? So we've seen the logistic model in something as simple as sharks and minnows, right? Of course. And then we can extend this model to a, um, to like our pandemic. Now it turns out, just disclaimer, there is a pandemic model um, that, or an, an epidemic model that has three coupled differential equations. If you guys take the uh, Virginia Tech, I think it's a 5,000 level engineering, methods of mechanical engineering analysis, um, that course actually covers the, the uh, infectionist model. And also I think the uh, 1,000 level math, 1025 Emporium math covers that as well. Okay, so it is a pretty interesting model, of course, the whole purpose of this discussion here in this section was just to talk about how differential equations can be used to model a lot of different things that we may not expect, okay? And it turns out that we can actually model them with pretty good precision as long as we have the right parameters given to us, right? So R, of course, our PE, and the other things as well from the earlier examples, okay? So those are the four examples that I wanna go over in the class. Um, there is one example that or one one model that I didn't go over, which was the bacterial growth model, and I actually just remembered it right now. But the bacterial growth model is actually just this, but positive. That's it. Okay. So you guys will see how how popular this model becomes uh, as we go through the course. Okay, great. The very last thing I want to talk about in this lecture is going to be existence and uniqueness. Okay, so recall when we talked about the direction field, I kind of drew that, um, uh, the solution, I said it was gonna look like this, and, and to be honest with you, I really have no idea if it's actually gonna look like that. I just gotta just guess based on the direction field. Of course, having a more detailed direction field will help us 
get a better answer. But let's suppose that this was the answer that the direction field gave us. And let's say, well, how do I know for sure that this is the only solution? Like, how do I know that it doesn't like go like this? Okay, well, that is going to be determined by our existence and uniqueness theorem, okay? And uh, the existence obviously tells us, is there a solution that even exists, okay? And the, the uniqueness is, is, if there is a solution that exists, is it the only solution, okay? So let's go ahead and talk about that. Okay, so there's only two rules that we really need to know, okay? So if my equation, if my um, ODE is linear, okay, so linear ODEs, then we only have one solution. Okay, so if a solution exists, which uh, we will talk about on the literally the section after this in the middle of the page. Okay, so if a solution exists for a linear ODE, then that is for sure the only solution. Okay, because if you guys remember from linear algebra, right, two lines that cross, if there's a solution, it's gotta be right here and this has to be the only one because these lines are straight and they go on forever. Okay, so we can treat the differential, linear differential equations with the same manner, okay? That if there's a single solution, then it is the only solution, okay? For a nonlinear differential equation, it's a little bit different, okay? It's a little bit tricky, but we have a way to tackle that. And for a nonlinear, then we have, if a solution exists, okay, then it's unique if df dy is continuous on interval of existence. Okay, so uh, you guys can have this uh, in your notes already, but recall that our differential equation is equal to y prime equals f of ty. What we do is we take the actual function itself, right, with y in it, take the derivative with respect to y, so we find essentially, okay, like that, dy. Take the derivative with respect to y and then say, is this continuous on the interval of existence? Okay, now, what is the interval of existence? We will talk about that right now. So notice that, right, so our, our nonlinear, we just have to check this, right, the partial derivative of f with respect to y. Uh, I realized that some folks who are taking differential equations right now have not taken multivariable calculus yet. Uh, I think that should be the computer engineers and the computer science folks who take differential equations first before taking multi. But this fancy D right here, all it means is that you treat T as a constant and you treat Y as the independent variable. So actually I'll just make an example of right now just to help you guys out. So for example, we had earlier, we had the uh, Y prime, I think it was equal negative T over Y. Right, for that direction field problem. So if I wanted to take the derivative with respect to y, I, I don't have to use quotient rule here, okay? I do not have to use quotient rule because I'm treating my, uh, I'm just taking the derivative with respect to y, okay? It's not implicit differentiation, it's just um, this with respect to y. So t is a constant, okay? So what I get is I get negative, right? If I rewrite this as, negative ty to the negative one, I get negative and then negative one ty to the negative two. So after you do all some stuff, you end up getting t over y squared as my <coughs> uh, partial derivative of f with respect to y, okay? Now, the question is, uh, is this continuous over my interval of existence? Well, we're gonna talk about the interval of existence right now, okay? Cool. Okay, so what is my interval of existence? Now, consider the following, which is this differential equation. Okay, so in this course, I will do my best to I have done my best, I already wrote the notes out, but I, I've done my best to use examples to teach you guys where it's relevant and then use 
theorems and descriptions to teach you guys things more relevant. Because I know in the actual course, uh, in most college classes, the teacher does a lot of derivations, like derivation, derivation, derivation. Oh, here's one example. Okay, now go do a uh, homework problem. Well, that's good, but sometimes if the derivation is not well explained and just copied from a textbook, um, <clears throat> then the you guys won't actually understand like how to apply it okay so when i find that just using an example to teach something is easier then i will do that all right so for example that's what we're going to do here is just talk about this okay interval of existence for this particular equation okay and just for a note the interval of existence is just hey if i have a solution where can my solution exist okay and we'll of course talk about that right now so First thing you do, put it into standard form. We must, must put it into standard form, okay? Do not think about doing an interval of existence problem if you have not standard form. As you can see, our y prime has a friend over here and we want the y prime to have no friends. So y prime is equal to one over sine of t times t minus one. Y equals cosine of t over sine of t. Okay, great. Oh. Plus, sorry, or minus, man. right? So we have this right here, and it's asking us, hey, um, where can my solution exist? Okay, so we need to look at this very carefully because essentially what's going to determine my interval, interval of existence is going to be my P of T and my G of T. As you guys already know, my P of T is this right here, okay? In negative included, this is my P of T, okay? And this is my g of t, okay? So essentially, we are looking for the domain of my p of t and g of t, which is going to be the following. The first thing we do is look at our problem points, okay? What makes you nervous? Okay, in this problem, sine of t is in the denominator, that makes me nervous. And then we have a t minus one in the denominator, that makes me nervous. Cosine of t is just chilling, okay? We don't need to look at cosine of t at all. Okay, because cosine of t is, is not problematic, thank goodness, okay? Sine of t cannot equal zero. Okay, I know that for sure. And then t minus one also cannot equal zero, okay? So obviously t cannot equal one, and then our sine of t cannot equal zero, so therefore t cannot equal zero, uh, pi, two pi, three pi, so it's gonna be n pi, or of course, n is an integer, all right? So you can see that I've gotten that down there in the notes, okay? Now, the question is, all right, Scott, well, we've determined what values can be, so let's go ahead and graph our thing is gonna be t and y like this. What can't it be? It cannot, so this is how you have to write it on the homework. Um, it can't be zero, it can't be one, it can't be pi, and two pi, so I'll just label them. So zero, one, pi, two pi, and then I'll just label here. Negative pi, okay, negative two pi, and so on and so forth, right? The question is, okay, well my solution can't be any of those things, great. But what determines where our solution actually is, and that is going to be called the initial condition, okay? So initial, I can't spell, initial condition, okay, is going to be called y of t0 equals y0, which essentially says y, the function of the value of y at its initial point is equal to its initial value, which makes sense, which, um, which is kind of like self-explanatory, but looks ugly. Uh, the example that I used is y of 2 equals 1. Okay, so I said y of two is equal to one, which means that at t equals two, y equals one, okay? And if you look, well, is my t even allowed to equal two? Okay, two, it's right here. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm allowed to have t equals two, right? So I know that my solution starts somewhere in here, okay? It starts somewhere between one and pi. So I can say that my t is somewhere between one and pi, like such, right? You guys remember this notation from calculus? And I don't really care what my what my y value is, because like right, this this these dotted lines extend to 
positive and negative infinity, so it, if it starts here, it doesn't really matter, right? But what we need to note is that our function, our solution of y, okay, has to be continuous, okay? Our solution of y has to be continuous because remember that our differential equations represent something in the real world and they ha it has to be continuous, right? You can't jump from one thing to another thing. Now, if it's continuous, that means I can't cross these dotted lines and that's the reason why I drew them, okay? You cannot cross these dotted lines here. So once I'm in this, I can't go anything less than or equal to one and I can't go anything greater than or equal to pi, all right? So I'm stuck in here. I can't go anywhere, right? Now, where does it go? We'll have to solve this in order to know where it goes, but I'm just showing you guys that this rectangle is the rectangle that we are confined to at this time, all right? And this is called the initial condition, like I mentioned, and the combination of the differential equation and the initial condition is called the initial value problem, okay? So if it's the ODE and initial condition IC, so put the IC here, okay, yields initial value problem, IVP, okay? So these are the letters that you're gonna use. If you see the letters IVP, which are used all the time in this class, okay? If you see IVP, it means the initial value problem, which means that there is a differential equation and there's an initial condition, okay? Differential equation and the initial condition. So in the previous page, when I talked about the, uh, what was it? The tank problem or something like that, or whatever, right? When there's no input, Okay, so there's like the differential equation y prime plus p of t y equals zero, right? Which is our first order differential equation with no input. We said, well, if there's no input, how can something happen, right? And the reason why something can happen is if our initial condition is not equal to zero, right? Our initial condition does not have to be equal to zero. So for example, uh, if I have like a slinky, right? If I obviously, if I just like, uh, just kind of leave it and it's that it won't go anywhere right if it's just that static position But if I provide an initial condition right? if I raise it and then I drop it It's gonna go like this right even if nothing is actually perturbing the system. I'm not hitting it I'm not doing anything to it, right? I just raise it up. I let it go right? I apply some initial conditions to it and it's gonna go right or if I hit it boom And then it's gonna go again. We'll see actually the slinky example will come back to us uh, in one of the following lectures when we talk about second-order differential equations Okay, so that is it for this lecture. Okay, so in this lecture, we talked about, of course, what is a differential equation. We said that it is simply just an equation that has y prime and it is a function of t and y. Okay, we talked about the general form of the uh, differential equation. We talked about direction fields, classified our linear versus nonlinear, and then our autonomous differential equation, which if you remember has no value of t in there. Okay, afterwards, we covered the four types of differential equations that model our real world problems, and then we added a fifth one in there, which is the bacterial growth. Okay, and then after that, we talked about our existence and uniqueness, which it helps us see if, first of all, if there is a solution, and second of all, where can that solution exist? And third of all, of course, is it the only solution? Okay, in the next lecture, I'm going to go over the uh, method that we're going to use in order to solve these differential equations okay so you're wondering now like hey you know i'm, I'm tired of uh <laughs> i'm tired of I'm just looking at these i want to solve it i want to see what the actual solution is going to be okay so we will look at both of the ways to solve our first order non-linear or first order linear differential equations and we will also find a method to solve our first order non-linear differential equations as well we'll do a couple examples and then we will talk about what to do if we can't find a way to solve a differential equation because as you can see, okay, these are a little bit complicated. So we said, okay, well, if we can't solve it on pencil and paper, then how can we uh, solve or perhaps approximate the answer? Okay, and with that, I will see you guys next time.